All right, so I'm going to be speaking uh, today about the Decentralized Unincorporated Nonprofit Association, which is a uh, legal entity form that was uh, recently approved in, in Wyoming. Um, so we're going to cover a couple quick topics. I've got about seven minutes. We're going to go through go through pretty quick, but I'm happy to take questions or, or follow up with, with anyone. Um, so the three key challenges that, that I see that DAOs face currently, right, is that they have no legal existence, um, no ability to, to contract, no ability to show up in court. Um, that has pr proved to be pretty disastrous in the case of Oki, uh, as well as, as you know, there was a recently a maker in, uh, infringement case um, where they had difficulty showing up. And if it wasn't for the DeFi Education Fund, um, you know, that we would have likely faced uh, significant consequences there. Uh, they have no ability to pay taxes. Um, this is, has resulted in a lot of, um, you know, consternation around kind of treasury diversification, protocol revenue, uh, things like that. Uh, and then there's potential unlimited liability. Um, there is our, our number of, of class action lawsuits taking place in California right now, uh, all alleging, uh, and, and in New York, all alleging that, that DAOs are general partnerships, um, which means that individual members are responsible for, um, you know, the wrongdoings of other members and the protocol. Uh, and, um, you know, that is in the case of, of both compound and Lido, um, you know, the suits are being brought on the basis that, um, you know, all of the members are responsible for, some, you know, a person buying and selling a token and losing money. Um, so pretty existential risk, I think to, uh, you know, the entity structure, uh, and it's been something I've been kind of focused on for about three years right now. Um, so the demo was, uh, passed into law on March 7th. It goes into effect on July 1st. Uh, it's closely based on Wyoming's existing uh, unincorporated nonprofit association statute. It's actually just a subcategory of that statute. Um, DAOs can automatically transition between Wyoming, UNOs, and DUNOs. The, the UNO structure is one that, that myself and David Kerr have written a lot about. Um, you know, one of the the piece, points of friction for that use of that kind of entity form was that people weren't sure whether or not the Wyoming legislature intended for um you know, intended for it to be used by DAOs and, and, you know, the Wyoming Duna bill basically ex expressly, um, uh, contemplates use of, of it as by DAO. So it opens up kind of that framework as well. Um, and, you know, I'll just right off the bat, we'll say that this structure is not intended to be tax optimized. My, my vision of the, the future of web three is not one where, uh, you know, the entire industry is, is run via offshore foundations and no one is paying tax or engaged in tax compliance. I think, you know, as we start to see the industry reach out or reach out and great, um, gain, you know, favor with more, you know, retail face users and things like that. I think that, you know, tax compliance is going to become more uh, important and, and it's going to become a more important political topic, uh, as you know, politicians kind of, kind of understand, um, you know, the current tax situations and where there's a lot of tax that's not currently being paid. Um, so just to, to be uh, very clear, you know, that while the DUNA is called a decentralized unincorporated nonprofit association, um, nonprofit is not the same of, as charitable, right? Nonprofits are commonly mistaken for, for being, you know, tax exempt entities, but that is not the case. Uh, as a, the, ultimately, what is considered to be nonprofit in a given state is up to that state. Uh, and for I mean, DUNAs, they are able to engage in all sorts of profit making activity. And, you know, they are able to compensate their members um, for, you know, providing services to the DAO, um, though they are not able to engage in direct distributions, you know, such as a dividend. Um, in terms of suitability, uh, you know, at, at A16Z Crypto, we are looking at, at kind of using the structure basically for any company that has a, a nexus in the U.S. Um, and that is using tokens to govern an asset. Um, there are some caveats to that, that I'll go into later. Um, but essentially where you do have governance tokens that are controlling a smart contract protocol that has the potential to generate revenue or, you know, a smart contract or a, a treasury of some sort, right? All of that type of activity. Um, I think there are benefits to having the Duna in place. Um, and I'll go into those in a bit. Um, so benefits and risks. Um, the, I'll just go into a couple of these because I don't have too much to, but, but the, the, the entity structure lets DAOs be DAOs, right? So for the first time, we have legislation in the United States that really um, takes the uh, it turns, you know, code is law actually into a real thing. Um, and as a result of that, the smart contracts of the governance protocol are actually incorporated into the governing principles of the DUNA. Um, and you can, you know, basically kind of, uh, operate your, your structure the same way that the DAOs are operated now. It's very low touch and it's permissionless. Um, it does provide limited liability. Uh, it preserves privacy. It's not subject to the court transparency act. Um, on the limited liability front, right, it, it does also allow you to enforce arbitration against token holders. This would 
significantly limit the ability of token holders to sue one another, um, which is, you know, one of the emerging vectors of attack that, that plaintiff's firms are bringing against DAOs. Um, you know, it, it can help with, with promoting decentralization, right? I think that just having the argument that, you know, if a, uh, token holders are joining an organization that's called a decentralized unincorporated nonprofit association, um, you know, throw some shade on SEC allegations that, that people have reasonable expectations of profit. It's obviously not dispositive, but I do think it's helpful. Um, and then it, you know, it enables, you know, strategic tax planning for treasury diversification, protocol revenue and token all floor revenue. I think those are key things, um, that are largely being ignored in, in the general tax discussion of, of how, um, you know, DAOs are currently structured. Um, there are some, some risks there's, there's potential misuse, uh, potential conflicts of law and linger uncertainty, I'll, uh, tax uncertainty. I'll speak to those briefly. Um, so misuse you know, should not be used by every DAO. Uh, it's not, you know, designed to facilitate significant real world operations. Um, you know, you shouldn't jam a, a hierarchy structure within these dunas and, and, um, you know, operate them accordingly. These are really intended to be a very thin wrapper for software. Um, and you know, that's what it's, it's designed to do. Um, it's also not suitable, as I was saying earlier for, you know, equity like economic models where, you know, to, uh, DAOs are engaged in, and, you know, dividends and stock buybacks or token buybacks essentially. Right. Uh, from a conflicts of law perspective, it obviously is a new entity structure. Um, and within new entity structure, you do have to be careful about conflicts of law. Uh, the nice thing about Wyoming is that, um, you know, the UNA, which is what the, the DUNA is based on, right? The, the Wyoming UNA is, is kind of the same, you know, type of entity structure that's already been adopted in 28 states. Uh, in addition to that, Wyoming has a, a, uh, a bill that allows you to kind of register your tokens in Wyoming. Uh, you can easily establish physical nexus there. So, you know, the chance that all of these things just kind of bolster, uh, you know, the, the, the claim that, that Wyoming law should apply to, um, you, you know, the organization as opposed to it, it being obviated by, you know, some aggressive state like California. Um, and then on tax uncertainty, um, you know, the key kind of thing that we're, we're kind of focused on here is that, you know, at the end of the day, there's some question as to, you know, what type of intermediated activity is the Dow engaged in? Um, what are the, the economic consequences of that activity? Um, and then what are the, you know, tax obligations associated with it? But the DUNA doesn't have to, you know, wrap uh, an entire protocol. I uh, bring all of that activity within it. So for instance, if you were to just think about like Uniswap, right, use of a DUNA in that case would not kind of cover the liquidity pools where, um, you know, you have individual users engaged in peer-to-peer -peer kind of trading of, of, of assets. So as a result, you know, that activity would not come into the tax compliance obligations of, of the DUNA. But you have to be very careful on this structure, and I'll go into that a little bit more um, in, in, a, in a few slides. Um, so for in terms of structuring, uh, you know, the, the way that we're kind of envisioning this at the start is to basically kind of go down the same pathway that the DAOs are typically launched today. Um, but the DUNA kind of plugs in on top of them. Um, so you can use, uh, you know, structures where the tokens are minted in the United States or ones where the tokens are, are minted um, and a foreign foundation. All of these kind of work. The DUNA is, is pretty plug and play to, to kind of layer into these structures um, and, and isn't, isn't very complicated to, to do. There's only a, a few bells and whistles that are, are pretty straightforward. Um, so as I was saying, what, what activity from a tax perspective, what activity do you actually cover with the DUNA? Uh, and really the, the way that we're contemplating this is that the DUNA, you know, will cover those activities over which token holders have, uh, have control, right? And so as a result of that, if they have you know, potential fees and, and are, have um, uh, dominion and control over those fees, right, that activity would be within the DUNA for activities that are totally uh, automated and um, permissionless and censorship resistance, you know, things like liquidity pools on, on Uniswap. Um, those would not fall within the, the model. So this is really going to, this gives you a lot of kind of opportunity and open up, opens up a very large design space for what activity you actually want to bring into the DUNA versus leaving it outside of it, right? And so, so where the DUNA kind of covers is really going to be a function of what your token economic model is uh, and what your governance model is. So here's just one example of a very straightforward protocol, right? If you, um, you know, this is one that doesn't have a fee switch, Right. If you if you basically just have governance smart contracts that control, uh, you know, a treasury, right, and maybe the upgradeability of the protocol of all, right, we would say that the the or, or not the upgradeability, but if the protocol is immutable, right, you would say that in this situation, um, that's the activity that is covered by the the Duna um, and activity beyond that, such as the activity of the foreign foundation um, or the protocol itself, would not within the Duna. And so that helps kind of you know with strategic tax structure and and, and compliance. 
um, also kind of helps kind of draw a diagram around where the, the limited liability applies. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, in the process of rolling this out to with the several, with several DAOs um, that are, you know, kind of uh, midway through, um, you know, until July 1st, the bill, you know, doesn't go into effect, but it's very easy to kind of roll it out in terms of having a, uh, an UNA set up and that, that automatically transitions to the DUNA um, once it is available. Um, so we're kind of running full speed, working on that. And, and David Kerr and I are currently in the process of, um, um, you know, we're, we're kind of writing uh, and engaged with a bunch of tax advisors uh, and, uh, you, you know, other uh, law firms to, to basically build out a whole suite of tools and, you know, memos around tax structuring and all of these things so that this uh, entity structure will be pretty easy for, for practitioners to use throughout the space. Thank you very much, Miles. That was awesome. Anybody here want to ask any follow-up questions on that? Adam, you might want to come on up. You're, you're next. Okay. Well, it looks like you, you covered it all, Miles, so thank you very much. 